The gift given in Hebrews chapter 1 says, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The one that's watching over us, the one that went to the cross, made the place. And the revelation that Jesus brought wasn't just a revelation of how to keep the rules better. He said, in the past, God's spoken to us in many ways. He used a donkey. He's used signs and wonders. He's used the prophets. But in these last days, he sent his son. What's the one revelation a son could give that no one else could? He could help us understand God is Father. God is Father. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he'd provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. His work was completed. There's been a gift given to us. Don't take your eyes off of it. Don't give your heart to something else. We have a choice. God, thank you for what you've done for us. The the incident of discouragement and depression and heaviness is higher in this season of year than any other time in the year. And I'm quite confident that with with the the virus and all the challenges it brings, that it's worse than it, it typically is. And it's not an easy thing. We can laugh a bit, but I don't really want to make light of it. It's real. There's a battle within us. There's a battle for us. And it requires some self-discipline on our part. You cannot allow yourself the emotional luxury of giving vent to everything you feel. You may not feel like celebrating. You may not like the circumstances. You may have liked the world better 24 months ago. There may be other reasons you're challenged today. But the truth is, God has given us a gift. And I choose to think about that. I will read those birth stories in Matthew and Luke over and over and over again. I'll begin to quietly say to the Lord, God, I thank you that you care about me. I'll do my best not to give my attention to those who are choosing ungodliness. When the ungodly choose ungodliness, it's not that big a deal because it's not a change of course for them. The real wounds are when there are people that you have walked with and journeyed with and and done life with and you see them struggle. It happens to all of us. Because there have been times and seasons in our life when we were the ones struggling and we were causing grief in the hearts of others. You have to, to, with a determination, even if your heart is broken, say, God, I love you. God, I believe you're just. I believe you're faithful. I don't like my circumstances, but I love you. I thank you for your kindness to me that my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And if you want me to sit in the midst of this circumstance until I hear the trumpet, I will worship you. Don't allow the enemy to give you a burden that God didn't. God may have led you through a shadowed valley because there are times and places when he does that with us. But it doesn't mean he's withdrawn from you. He's our strength. He's our redeemer. He has given us a gift, and his name is Jesus. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascended back to heaven. The church goes public and starts the Jesus ministry in his absence. But just a few chapters into the book of Acts, Jesus is back in time. He's on the Damascus road recruiting a new messenger. This time it's Saul of Tarsus. He's an angry, violent Pharisee who hates Jesus' followers and is dragging him towards prisons. And Jesus steps back into time to get his attention. Well, Saul of Tarsus becomes Paul the Apostle, one of our heroes. I hope he's a friend of yours. You read his letters all the time as you read through the New Testament. 
Well, Paul was an advocate for Jesus in a season of tremendous turmoil, a lot of confusion. There was a lot of political pressure. There was a lot of deception. In fact, there was a tremendous cost to be an advocate for Jesus. Paul was willing to take on that cost to the point that he's still speaking to you and me today. His messages to the church are powerful words of encouragement for the circumstances that we face today. We've prepared a tool for this new year. It's a daily devotional that I built out of Paul's letters to those churches. We put it in a journal fashion so that on a daily basis, we can reflect on the lessons that Paul was sharing with those people with whom he was making the journey so the Spirit of God can give application in your life and mine. It's that daily feeding, meditating, thinking about the Word of God in the context of the challenges of this day that brings true strength to us. And we need God's strength in this season. The fact that I'm born again or I had a God experience last year isn't enough. I need to know God today, this week, this month, now. Well, I believe this tool, it's a devotional built out of those letters from Paul, will be a tremendous strength to you in this year. Open your heart, begin to say to the Lord, I want to follow you. We're the 21st century edition of the book of Acts, and we want to do it in a way that honors Jesus, just like Saul of Tarsus learned to. God has called us to be salt and light in our generation, and Pastor Allen's new 90-day devotional book, Lessons from Paul, can help. The devotions apply the truth of Paul's letters to our current circumstances. They can help encourage, equip, and strengthen us to follow the Lord, no matter what's ahead. Lessons from Paul is a high-quality, full-sized book, and each day includes a scripture, devotional, prayer, writing prompt, and a place to journal. We'll send it to you as a thank you for your donation of $25 or more today. When we encounter hardships, will we decide to follow God, or will we pull away? Let's learn how to stand courageously with Lessons from Paul. Request your devotional today by going to alanjackson.com or call 800-880-5102. You know, exchange means you trade something for something else. But God has given us gifts. There's a verse in, in 2 Peter that I think is, worth, is noteworthy. We're reading through the prophets right now, if you're doing the Bible reading with us. All those books at the end of your Old Testament that are hard to find. Aren't you glad we're just doing it page after page? In 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter's, he's near the end of his life. His strength is faded, his hair is gray. He says, we didn't follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. I love that sentence. Yeah, I didn't tell you something I learned in school. He said, I was an eyewitness. I about drowned in Galilee that night. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love and with him I'm well pleased. It was there when he was baptized. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven. We were with him on the sacred mountain. We were there for the transfiguration. We saw Moses and Elijah. We have the word of the prophets made more certain. And you'll do well to pay attention to it. I just didn't want to talk to you about the gift of Jesus without reminding you what Peter said. Peter knew the boss. And he said, don't forget the prophets. In fact, he said, you better pay attention to them. When you're reading through those little books, when I read them these days, it feels like they're speaking to our current events. People will say to me from time to time, I'm not sure we should talk about current events. I said, well, if you're not going to talk about God and current events, you're going to have to get rid of your Bible. Because that's all the prophets talked about. That's what Jesus talked about. It's what the letters in the New Testament talk about. And then there's this notion of Jesus is our friend. Acts chapter 13, it's, it's, it's maybe my favorite statement about King David in the whole Bible, and it's in the New Testament. So just after removing Saul, he made David king. And he testified concerning him that I've found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He'll do everything I want him to do. He'll do everything I want him to do. 
I don't know what you're striving to become or accumulate or achieve or what recognition you would like, but I would humbly submit to you, there is no, no better statement that could be made of you than if the creator of heaven and earth said, you would do whatever he wanted you to do. He just do whatever I wanted him to do. What are you afraid of? He's going to take something from you. What do you have he needs? You think he's trying to get your hand on your stuff? You think he wants your favorite recipe for figgy pudding? What exactly is it? I've, I've lived with that. I thought, oh God, I couldn't serve you. I'd have to give too much up. Exactly. And I believed it to the core of my being. So I understand that struggle. He'll do anything, everything I want him to do. In Job chapter one, Job's a tough book. Not an easy story, but the, at the beginning of the book, it says, the Lord, said to, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Have you looked at Job? That's my boy. Don't you want God to talk about you that way? You know, we struggle so much to own the Lord, own our faith when we're outside of church. Are we willing to be Christian at work? Are we willing to be Christian when we're with our friends? Are we willing to be Christian when we're at the ball fields or when we're recollection? Don't you want God to say, that's my kid right there. That one over there. That's that one. Have you seen my servant Job? All of a sudden I'm thinking, maybe I'm going to stand up for the Lord a little more straight. In Numbers 12, it says, listen to my words. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, there's a rebellion amongst God's people. They were complaining long before Corinth. I reveal myself to him in visions and I speak to him in dreams, but this is not true of my servant Moses. He's faithful in all my house. When I, with him, I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Boom! God comes down to talk to his covenant people, the ones that he got out of the brick pits of Egypt. And he said, listen, I've talked to you people in a lot of ways. Pillars of cloud and pillars of fire. And we had a few plagues tossed in there. But I talked to Moses face to face. Why were you not afraid to mess with him? Next time you're suffering from injustice, just quietly run that tape over in your head. Oh, if you knew my boss, you back up. Don't make him come for you. Do not make him come for you. It won't go well. We're children of the king. We don't have to be angry. We don't have to be vindictive. We don't have to be filled with hate or panic or fear. God is watching over us. Something better is ahead of us. We'll walk through some difficult places and some shadowed seasons and it's not all easy. But we are friends with the king. Wouldn't you like to be? Revelation chapter one. I love this verse. This is the introduction to that book that's so intimidating to many. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the theme of the book. It's a revelation of Jesus. You know he came in Bethlehem. You know the story. Well, Revelation tells us what it's going to be like when he comes the next time. And he's coming for you and me. It's, it's, a, it's a rescue mission. He's coming. Don't be afraid of Revelation. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. Remember in, in, in Acts chapter one, when the disciples are asking about when the kingdom's going to be restored to Israel and Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or the dates that the father is set. It's none of your business. That's God's business. Well, now at the beginning of revelation, it says it's a revelation that God has given to Jesus to show his servants what must soon take place. And Jesus made it known how by sending his angel to his servant, John. What if John had said, well, do I have to go to church today? The Titans are on. It's a beautiful day. It'd be a great day to be at the lake. Just a few verses down from that. It says on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit. Jesus, God said, I've, I've got a message for when you're going back to get your friends. And Jesus said, I know who to send the angel to. John's still there. 
Folks, let's decide to be his friend. I'm not interested in being religious. I'm not particularly interested in the rules. I understand God has drawn some boundaries and I want to honor those and respect them and abide by them. But more than any of that, I want to live as if he were my friend, not my buddy. I have people that I would consider friends and we don't hang out or we don't interact with great frequency, but there's a trust between us, a confidence between us. I want to be God's friend. I want him to be able to say of you or me what he said of David. You'll do whatever he asks you to. I want to be said of us what we just read. That's such a marvelous idea to me. It, it, It intrigues me. I have a message that needs to be delivered. And I have a friend that will be willing to say it. We got to stop pointing at our baptism picture and say, there's no business left for me to do with God. I'm happy to celebrate the day when your your new birth took place. One day we will stand before the judge and you want to be prepared. What else are you doing? What is it that's so important to you that we're so busy with that it's more valuable than being prepared for your appointment with the judge of all the earth? Good to be with you again. Our topic in this session is listening to God. You know, the the primary characteristic of God's people throughout Scripture, both Hebrew Bible and New Testament, is that we listen to His voice. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. In Hebrew, it's an ancient language. You add emphasis by duplicating. In Hebrew, it says, listen, listening, or turn your ear and listen. The paying attention to the voice of God, understanding that He's inviting us towards Him, changes everything in our lives. The goal is not just to be born again and sit on our good intentions. It's to understand God's invitation for us today. The reason that matters is we're living in the midst of a season of incredible turmoil. Change is swirling around us. And if your primary input is the news media, whichever source you choose, you'll be confused. Grab your Bible and a notepad. Most of all, open your heart. Let's listen for what the Lord has for us today. And it's it's really still in my heart, this God bless America. We need the blessing of God upon our nation. And folks, that's only coming because of the voice of the church. I'm telling you, we're not defeated. It doesn't matter what your adversaries say about us or what those that don't believe in God think or what they posit or who cares? He's the creator of heaven and earth and everything that's in it. And his blessings will change our future. But it begins with us and our willingness to listen and respond to God. And we haven't been great at this. We've imagined we could secure our futures through our hard work and our intellect and our our cleverness. And we could use the same systems that the secular people were using and craft a life for ourselves that would be fulfilling its deception. We're children of the king, and we have a different playbook. We have a different set of values. And I want to start with a a component of that that we don't like to, maybe isn't talked about a great deal, but God is judge of all. And one of the reasons we serve him is we know that one day we will stand before the judge. That's not a threat. It's a promise. You want to be prepared for that. It's not a day of dread. It's a day of anticipation. I seem to be able to remember at least one time in my academic career where I went to class prepared. I can't say it happened frequently, but I can remember at least one time. And on that one occasion, you went to class with anticipation. Call on me. I read the assignment. Aren't you going to take up our homework? You know, the rest of the days you're in the back of the class trying to hide under the desk. But once, well, one day we will stand before the judge and you want to be prepared. What else are you doing? What is it that's so important to you that we're so busy with that it's more valuable than being prepared for your appointment with the judge of all the earth? And and please, 
you know, I'm grateful that you're born again, that you've experienced the new birth. It's essential. It's necessary. But please don't imagine that's the only question on the test. We want to be prepared. Not my idea. Matthew chapter 25. Jesus is teaching. When the Son of Man comes in his glory. I love that phrase. We really have very limited information about Jesus in all of his glory. We know him as a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger. I mean, they put him in a barn in a feed trough. We'll look at a verse in a moment. When, when the glory of our Lord is made visible, it will cause the sun to look diminished. Do you think about the Lord and his glory? With 10,000 times 10,000 angels? You know, we get wide-eyed because he could walk on the water. Folks, he made the water. Can you imagine seeing him in all his glory? And him calling you friend. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he'll sit on his throne in heavenly glory. And all the nations will be gathered before him. And he'll separate the people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. I remember years ago, I don't remember the lesson, but I remember the title. Avoid the goat line. <laughs> that's, that's just not the line you want to be in. And they're not going to ask to see your WOC membership card. Or if you were registered in our children's ministry so you could check in your kids. It'll have everything to do with the person of Jesus of Nazareth and your relationship with him. How you've conducted your life in relation to him. That appointment is before every one of us. The scripture says that we all have two appointments. Death and after that, judgment. And you, you won't be able to sense to substitute. You won't be able to blame another person. It won't be the president's fault or your husband or your wife or the kids or your parents or your boss. We have those appointments. There's a phrase that gets bantered around quite a bit these days. It's not new, but it's, it's kind of been reintroduced again. You want to be on the right side of history. You know, history is a human construct. We write history. History is constantly being rewritten. We're watching it again. But the judge of all the earth will ultimately determine human history. It's not a mystery to him. He knows the ending at the beginning. He knows the precise moment when our Lord's going to step back into time. And that eastern sky will be lit up. And I, I want to submit to you. You want to think about this. You, you want to meditate on it. You want to live towards being on the right side of this history. There's a whole bunch of metaphors in the New Testament. The sheep and the goats we just read. The broad gate that many will enter in. And the narrow path that few will travel. That's the path you want. I'm telling you, if the majority of the people are moving in the same direction you're moving in, you have reason to be concerned. Your views and perspectives should not be shaped by the broad majority. Say, well, all my friends are Christian. I doubt it. The statistics are wrong. Half of our population can't be born again or we would be different. We wouldn't be sacrificing thousands of children a day if there were tens of millions of people born again in this nation. We wouldn't be tolerating the stuff we're watching. Again, I'm not throwing stones. I'm asking you and me to consider our lives, what we have stood for, what we are standing for. Now, there's some things that uh, there, there's two buckets, and I don't have a lot of time, and we're not going to dwell on any of these for long. But I, I put them in, in two buckets because they're, they're they're slightly different. What I want to label inhibitors. These are things that will separate you from God's love. If you choose them and tolerate them and allow them to incubate, they will separate you from the love of God. It has nothing to do with God's will or intent. 
That's the nature. So the, the, the first group is going to be a bit of higher significance. The second, I'm going to label distractions. They're a part of the journey. They come to all of us. But if you give them inappropriate attention, if you give them disproportionate attention, they'll become debilitating. So these are inhibitors. They're self-inflicted. They're self-induced separation. And you don't want to give place to them. The first is rebellion. Rebellion. And the seed of rebellion is in all of us. Adam gave birth to a race of rebels. That's the story of the book. And the new birth doesn't deliver you from that carnal instinct to rebel against God. How many of you know that's true? Few things are made more enticing than by saying don't. Whatever you do, don't look behind that door. Hebrews 3.16, who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? The, people, the generation that are held out to us as the greatest generation of rebels, the Exodus generation, are the generation that saw firsthand more dramatic evidence of the power of God perhaps than any generation in human history. They saw the plagues visited upon Egypt. They saw the Red Sea parted. They ate manna from the ground. They picked up off the ground. They drank water that came from the rock. They saw Moses on the mountain. I mean, they had... They followed a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. They, they had a consistent demonstration of the power of God, and yet they chose to rebel. It should give us pause. We live in the midst of the greatest blessings of God that any generation of people have ever known. There's never been another generation with the freedoms and abundance and blessings that you and I have known. And we didn't cause them, and we didn't earn them. We have benefited from them. And if that generation could rebel, I would submit to you, we can rebel. With whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who, who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? To whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed? What's the evidence of rebellion? It's disobedience. If you tell me you're not a rebel, your life needs to be filled with evidence of your obedience. Any place you're willingly, willfully, intentionally practicing disobedience, you are in rebellion. Not my opinion, it's biblical. So we see that they weren't able to enter because of their unbelief. Disobedience is fueled by and multiplied unbelief. If you want your belief to grow stronger, start being obedient to the truth that you know. Listen to the language. It says they rebelled, they sinned, they disobeyed, unbelief. It's, it's just, the words are startling. They heard, they were led out, they were angry, their bodies fell, they never enter his rest, they were unable to enter. I don't want to be in those categories. So rebellion, you don't want to tolerate it. Do not tolerate it in your life. Secondly, self-righteousness. It's an inhibitor. There's only... In Ephesians 2, in verse 8, it says, By grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Righteousness is kind of a fancy religious word. The ability to stand in the presence of God without fear, guilt, or shame. You're going to stand in God's presence. You will. <clears throat> so it's really important to know how to do that in righteousness. No fear, no guilt, and no shame, because you don't want to stand there guilty. It will not turn out well. So it's, it is a very important question. How do I achieve righteousness? And there are two pathways. You can seek to establish your own. I'll do it myself. Me do it. And it means you're going to keep all the rules for holiness and purity according to God's principles, not your own or, our, or the current culture's. Not politically correct rules by God's standards. Now, here's the challenge. You have to keep them perfectly. Because if you fail in one point, you're guilty of the whole thing. None of us can do that. So the alternative is the gift of righteousness. There's a third one I would tag for you, and it's other gods. False gods, if you prefer. 
Exodus 20 says, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And there's a period right there. There's no more discussion. No other gods. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. Most of us wouldn't imagine bowing before something carved from stone or wood or cast from metal. But God is also about authority and priority. And anything in our lives that we give a priority ahead of our, the, the lordship of Jesus is an idol. If it has a greater claim on our resources or our emotions or whatever. That's what Jesus talked about. What, what do you, your attitude towards your father or your mother or your brother or sister or your husband or wife. He said, I have to come first. So that's not easy. No kidding. You'll have to do some battle with that part of you that's a rebel. rebel. Rebellion, self-righteousness, false gods. The fourth one would be evil. You know, it's possible to love evil. Psalm 52. You love evil rather than good. Falsehood rather than speaking the truth. You love every harmful word. Oh, you deceitful tongue. Surely God will bring you down to everlasting ruin. He'll snatch you up and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. That's in the book of Psalms. We have to guard our hearts, folks. Don't practice deception. Just don't do that. Just don't give yourself to that. Don't be tolerant of that. Don't encourage that. You know, one of the great things about the Bible is You don't need to have the knowledge of a Jeopardy champ to be able to jump in. Just a quick review of the story, and boom, you're right there with it. And uh, sometimes it's those of us who think we know everything about God's story that are the ones who really need the review. So, as a way to help all of us, we're going to recap the entire story so far in under 60 seconds. 60 seconds, you say? Impossible! To which I say, well, maybe, but let's give this a shot. Okay, go. The story starts at the beginning of the whole enchilada. When God spoke the universe into existence, including creating the world's first man and woman. At first, life was perfect. But soon after, these folks and their kids and grandkids decided they didn't want to live the way God had told them to. And pretty much everybody on earth got into some kind of evil or another. So God decided to hit the reset button and wiped out all of earth with a flood, except for a man named Noah and his family. The population started to grow again, and eventually God chose a group of people to start a new nation called Israel. Israel went through some pretty rough stuff early on, like being slaves in Egypt, but eventually God rescued them and brought them into a giant piece of land God had promised to them. Later, God raised up a king named David to rule Israel. David was an amazing guy, helping people live the way God wanted. The people of Israel were united and living at peace. But when David's son Solomon became king, he sort of forgot about God and started to worship other gods. As you can imagine, that was about to spell great trouble, not only for Solomon, but for all of Israel. The truth is the Bible is intimidating. 66 books written over a long period of time, dozens of authors, different cultures, words we don't know how to pronounce, places we don't know where they are, and we're supposed to understand it. Most of us have just given up. Well, I built a tool to help. It starts with a timeline, 12 points that'll arrange the whole Bible for you in a chronological way so you'll know where Abraham fits in relation to Isaiah. It'll help you. And I found some crazy talented illustrators to do some whiteboard drawings along with it to make it not only accessible, it makes it kind of fun. You can do it as an individual study. You can do it as a group. You can do it with your kids or your grandkids. You can get your softball team together and do it. You can get your neighbors around a kitchen table. Hey, churches are struggling a bit. You're the church. You and your Bible, open your heart. It's the Whiteboard Bible. It'll be a blessing. The Whiteboard Bible Study makes the Bible easy for anyone to understand. And those who donate $100 or more today can request the complete set, which includes three DVDs with fun illustrations and three guidebooks. The Whiteboard Bible Study is a great resource to go through on your own or with a group of friends. Request yours by going to alanjackson.com or by calling 800-880-5102. 
Now, those four, I could have made an expanded list, but I think that's enough to give the Spirit of God a a place to begin. Let's just touch these distractions. These come to our lives, all of our lives. But if you give them disproportionate attention, they'll become debilitating to you. Failure. Failure is part of the journey. It is. You learn to walk by falling on your face a lot. And your parents videotape it and play it over and over and over again. It's cute. They, they call it learning. As you get older, we don't like to learn that way. You're going to make some mistakes. You'll make some as a Christ follower. You'll have the enthusiasm and the exuberance of, of that youthful season in your journey. And then you'll have the caution that comes as you, you gain a few scars. And you'll need the help of the Holy Spirit to help you overcome the caution so that you don't retreat. You know, physically, as, as we mature, we, we lose some of the benefits of our youthful physical skills. But spiritually, you become more valuable as you mature. Your experience, and it's not about chronology. You can be an old person chronologically and be a baby in Christ, or you can be a relatively young person and have some spiritual maturity. David had more spiritual maturity when he heard Goliath than anybody else in the whole Israelite army. Failure is a part of the journey. Inconsistency. Peter and James and John and the whole crew. But they weren't sloppy with their inconsistency. They get, oh, you know, no big deal. I mean, they had a major fail when their friend needed them the most. They didn't do well. But you find them in short order standing before the same Sanhedrin that orchestrated Jesus' death. And when they said, don't ever mention his name again, they said, you do what you have to do, but we'll be back there tomorrow with the same message. They weren't sloppy with their inconsistency. I'm a little weary with the the sloppiness with which we deal with our inconsistency. It should grieve us to the point that we say, never again. I believe in repentance and restoration and restitution. That's not an excuse for being casual. Failure, inconsistency, sin. We're going to struggle with sin. Hebrews 12, 4, in your struggle against sin, you haven't yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. It doesn't say you're not going to resist sin. Whose sin was Jesus resisting? Somebody else's. And you and I will struggle not only because of our predisposition to sin, we will struggle because we live in a sin-filled world. That's not fair. Ta-da! You're right. It's not. And it's a part of the struggle. It's why we have to be in overcomers. So sin is both internal and external. Don't capitulate. Well, it's difficult. Yes, it is. I get discouraged. Yes. I get weary in doing good. Seems like there's verses for all of this stuff. Do you remember them? Number four, we get discontent. Oh, it's a tool. We get discontent. A lack of contentment. I don't like where I'm at. I thought I'd be further along. We have more victories. It's harder than I wish it were. Why am I still doing this? 1 Timothy 6, 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment brings great gain. You want to find a way to move down the path more quickly? Practice contentment. Don't tolerate discontentment. Discontentment comes to you as an idea, as a, as a point of displeasure, as a, as a disappointment with the timeline or whatever it may be. No, you're not welcome here. I'm not going to meditate. I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to give it a place. I will rejoice in where God has asked me to stand today. You don't sound con- convic- convicted. Convinced is the word I was looking for. Failure, inconsistency, sin, discontent, injustice. It's not fair. Bingo. Psalm 73, verse 2, but as for me, my feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You're looking in the wrong place. Wicked people are going to have good things happen to them. Stop watching. They're not the judge. 
but it's not fair. You're right. I'm amused at people that talk about fairness and justice apart from the truth of God's word. There's no such thing. Human beings aren't just. Have you read history? Disappointment. My working definition of disappointment is something that shows up on your calendar that you didn't put there. It's an appointment that rolls into your life that you didn't schedule. I'm disappointed with this. They come to all of us. Good to be with you again. We're learning to lead with faith. Folks, there's a leadership shortage in our nation. I'm not talking about titles or positions or offices or desks, but influence. The intentional use of your influence for a biblical worldview, that's our life assignment. You may be a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker, but you've been assigned by Almighty God a leadership role in this generation. And it has nothing to do with titles or how many followers you have in the social media. It has to do with how you use the influence of your life. There are people that care about your opinion. They care about what you think about. They want to know how you see the world around you. And are we using our influence for godliness or not? It's an important question. We're going to look at some components to help us lead with excellence. Grab your Bible and a notepad. Most of all, open your heart. Enjoy the lesson. Uh, We've been talking about leading with faith. And I really chose this as a theme for this year because it seems to me that we need a new generation of leaders. There's a leadership deficit in our nation. Not a lack of people with titles or positions or an imagination of authority, but there is a lack of godly influence. And for that to increase, we need people who understand that their lives comes with influence and they're willing to use the godliness of their lives as a factor in that influence. So that character becomes a key component of our leadership, not our talent, not our gifts, not our physical skills or abilities, our intellectual acumen or the resources we can accumulate, but the formation of our character. It will change the people around you. It will change how you interact with people. It will change the quality of our homes, our communities, our schools, our congregations, and ultimately our nation. It won't, stop from the, it won't start from the top down. It will start in our homes. So I'm not encouraging you to learn how to gather stadiums filled with people or hundreds of thousands of followers on media platforms. I'm encouraging you to give attention to the formation of your character so that the influence of your life reflects a commitment and a devotion to godliness and holiness and purity that is stable and foundational for the people who interact with you. It's a different life goal. And it's one that has for too long been pushed aside or relegated to something that is secondary. It's a slower way. It's easier to grow tomato plants than oak trees. And if you're going to see to the formation of godly character, you'll have to defer some things in your life. You'll defer gratification. You'll defer some things. But it's worthwhile. And so we're taking a few weeks to try to understand that a little better. We've talked about the value of remembering the deliverances in our lives, maintaining a a good news list, both a personal list, those times in your life when unquestionably, unmistakably, God has shown you grace and mercy and kindness. He brought freedom or deliverance or he opened the door or he, in some way, you can say that outcome was better because something happened beyond myself. You want to maintain that list. You want to give attention to it. You want to recite it. You want to live with it. You want it to become a part of your present and not just some occasional visit with your past. In addition to that, I've encouraged you to build a broader list that includes truth breakthroughs that are beyond your life and your home and your family. We're walking through a season of lawlessness and deception that are certainly unprecedented in recent decades for our lives. And when deception is rampant and many people find it in broad scale ways, find it inconvenient to acknowledge God, it's important to be aware and to acknowledge what God is doing. 
And, and, and don't decry the fact that major outlets aren't doing that. You just decide to be an outlet for that. You start to pay attention to what God is doing. You, you'll see it in different ways. Uh, you, you'll see truth break into the public square that has been pushed aside or discredited or censored in previous weeks or months. This habit will enable us to pray with far greater confidence. And it will awaken you on a daily basis in a greater way to your essential role as a leader in our world. Not because you have great power or an important title, but because the creator of all things knows you. Our prayers initiate activity in the kingdom of our Lord, and that impacts the kingdoms of this world. If we don't believe that, don't sit in church. Now, if you're exploring Christianity, by all means, you come. But if you're a decades-old church sitter and you don't believe that's true, change. It's important. If we're not aware and we're not involved, we will forfeit, forfeit opportunities. And I don't intend to be a part of a generation that forfeits the kingdom opportunities presented to us. So start to keep your good news list, your personal one, your broader one. There's some things we're specifically praying for. I believe we need to pray for the, the healing of the division and the hatred in our nation. We're too divided. We've been pitted against one another. It's evil. We are one nation under God. We've been saying that as a matter of habit and routine my entire life. And I won't yield that. Monday is a day to honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It's a good day to pray for healing in our nation. Dr. King gave his life for the dream that in this nation we would judge, not be judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. We cannot relinquish that vision. I believe it was inspired by God in his heart. And we won't yield it. Because even in the moment, if you think it's trending in your direction, if we step away from that, it will bring destructive things to all of us. Pray for the unborn. They need your voice. They can't use their own yet. And they're being sacrificed daily for no higher purpose than convenience. Thousands of children on a daily basis, almost a 3,000 children a day. Lives are terminated in this nation and we support it as an export factor to the nations of the world. It's not a uniquely American sin by any means. It's a global problem, but this is where God has planted us. 3,000 children a day, and yet we continue to support politicians and political parties who brazenly advocate for such a heinous behavior. It's unthinkable for the Christians. Oh, we have all sorts of dances. Well, we have different priorities. No. No. Pray for leaders who fear God and protect our country. It's important prayer to pray. It's not about political parties or particular politicians. Pray for those in authority over us. It's a biblical assignment. But our borders have to be secure. Or we will forfeit our freedoms and liberties. That's not even a question. It's a reality. We become more vulnerable with each day. We become more vulnerable in Middle Tennessee or wherever you're listening. Each day that passes and our borders remain open. And they are open. As many as 2 million illegal people flooded into our nation last year. That is reported to us and we're coming. to understand the reporting that comes to us is a little fuzzy. And now it's openly being discussed, not as a part of some voting bill, it's being discussed apart from any legislative action, just as a fiat of people with authority that non-citizens be allowed to vote in our elections. It's unimaginable. Why wouldn't we just send ballots to China? or South America, or Africa, or wherever else. And if we're going to do it, millions of illegal immigrants and allowing them to vote will end the rule of law in our nation. It'll be finished. Wake up, pray, don't be angry. Now, on the other side of this equation, there is consistent good news. Day after day, week after week, we see it break into the public square. You know, for, all, for two years now, we have been enthralled with the discussions around COVID-19. It's real. I've done enough funerals. It's real. I'm not suggesting it isn't. 
But COVID-19 information is far more available and misinformation is slowly being revealed day after day and week after week. That's good news because it gives us better tools to navigate with, to make decisions with. The hospitalization and death rates have been overreported. That's very good news. Again, not to be reckless or callous or casual. We need to be prudent and wise, but it's good to know. The CDC this past week said that the cloth masks that have been so much advocated are not helpful with the virus. That's good news to have back in the public square. Not very many weeks ago, you'd be censored for such reckless statements. I would submit we need to, to pray. There's too, much, there's too much government money in health care. I understand the advantages, the cost advantages. We prefer it to be free. But if our health care is predominantly supported by government money, there is tremendous temptation to manipulate the truth in order to keep the money. And the pressure's too great. I'm not indicting anybody. I'm telling you folks, it's a slippery slope. Let's accept responsibility for our well-being. The government is not God. It's an idol. They cannot secure our future. The notion that we would all have the same thing is not a good promise from the government. It's a diminished life. If the government were in charge of flowers, we would have one color. God made them and we have an infinite variety. You can trust him. We haven't known him. We have stood at a distance from him. He's moving in the earth. He's awakening his people. It's an exciting time. It's a time filled with opportunity. Begin to maintain your list. Pay attention. Learn to think. There's some evidence that there's a spiritual struggling unfolding before us. That if you're not listening, if you don't have eyes to see and ears to understand and a receptive heart, you could miss it. But there's some things happening around us that I don't think you can define in any other way as except as expressions of evil. There's unprecedented chaos and confusion, and that's not just about what's happening in our streets. It started weeks and weeks and weeks ago with fear, tremendous fear. It sent us home, disrupted our routines, emptied our schools and our college campuses and our stadiums and our arenas. There's been tremendous deception and manipulation. There's been physical challenges, there's been hungry people, there's been murder. They're not the result of a virus or antagonism between segments of our culture. All of those things emerge as the presence of evil. Our nation is at a crossroads. It's a line of demarcation. We're gonna choose a direction very soon and it's not about an election. I believe what's in front of us is as important as Gettysburg has proven to be in our history. We need a God perspective. The challenge that we face isn't about the depravity of the wicked. The great challenge we face is the indifference of the faithful. We've got to have a heart change. Well, I worked for several weeks and put together some lessons that I've shared with our church and I wanna share them with you. We put them in a book, God Bless America Again. There's no question God has blessed this nation. He called us into existence and he has sustained us. What we will be in the future has more to do with the hearts of God's people than a politician or a political party or an election. We need a prophetic perspective from God right now. Enjoy the book. It may feel like it's too late for our faith to make a difference in our culture, but we have a God who is more powerful than any challenge we face. And the only way to carry God's truth into our nation's future is by us deciding to watch, listen, think, and act as God leads us today. Pastor Allen's book, God Bless America Again, can help. It's your generosity that enables Allen Jackson Ministries to continue broadcasting messages like the one you're watching now. So today, when viewers donate $25 or more, we'll send you God Bless America again, the book. Read the book and let it encourage you to boldly stand by your faith where you live and work. Request yours when donating today by going to alanjackson.com 
or by calling 800-880-5102. And I simply want you to understand that God's word in your life is indispensable. If you don't spend routine, regular, systematic time in the word of God, your spiritual life is diminishing. Attending worship services is not adequate. It'd be roughly the equivalent to having a meal a week or a workout a week. It's certainly better than not having the meal and it's better than skipping that one workout. But to imagine that the one meal or the one workout are going to generate health and strength would be deceptive. And we need regular investments in the word of God. You won't understand it all. I don't understand everything I watch on the evening news. I'm quite confident if I watch a sporting event that I don't understand everything I see, but I take the benefit from the part I do understand. I've never played professional sports. I don't know what's involved in preparing to compete at that level or the sacrifices that are, are made or the nuance or the subtlety or the scheming that's involved in the effective orchestration of those intricate activities, but I can enjoy it and appreciate it nonetheless. Why do you think there's an excuse in saying, I don't understand it all, or I don't understand it as fully as someone else might understand it, and therefore I don't have to engage? That, that, that is a, a mistake, and it robs you of a great deal. I brought you a list of scriptures. I'm not going to look at all of them with you, but I wanted you to see the significance throughout the breadth of scripture that is where we are encouraged to engage with God's word. In Joshua chapter one, Joshua is the leader who replaces Moses. One of the more difficult job descriptions in the Bible. Who wants to be Moses' successor? I mean, now come on. Plagues, Red Sea parting, manna, Ten Commandments. What are you going to, if you're Moses' successor, are you going to get 12? I mean, it's a tough job description. You're going to come in somewhere less than Moses, and that's Joshua. In Joshua 1, verse 8, he says, Do not let this book, this book of the law, depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. And you'll be prosperous and successful. I like that. That's a conditional promise. I mean, you would prefer to be prosperous and successful. About a third of you. What are the rest of you hoping for? Failure. Poverty. It says that if we will meditate on it, if we will think about it consistently and be careful to be obedient to it, that it will have an outcome in our journey through time. I believe that. I have lived that out. In, the most, in fact, I have consistently chosen improbable paths. And yet I have seen the goodness of God continue to come to my life. And it's not because I'm clever or uniquely righteous or holy or good, because it's not. I'm a product of the grace and the mercy of God and the redemptive work of the cross of Jesus. But God will honor his word if you will give it a place in your life. So I'm not sure I believe that. That's the point. I have commanded you, he said, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The second verse nine is as important as verse eight. He said, I've commanded you to be strong and courageous. The church is going to need strength and courage. If your faith is not affiliated in your thought process with strength and courage, begin to implement a change. And then he gives us some warnings. He says, don't be terrified. Don't be discouraged. If he's warning us against that, in the context of your faith, there will be terrifying things and discouraging things. And if you don't understand that your faith fits into the portfolio of terrifying things and discouraging things, when you're terrified or discouraged, you won't have faith as an asset. It won't be a resource available to you. But if you've begun to think about it and prepare yourself for it and understand this is what my faith was built for when Goliath is bellowing his challenge at me and threatening my future, I have an answer for him. And it's not about a javelin or my sword skills or the armor that I put on that was fashioned by the armor bearer. It's because of the covenant I have with Almighty God and Goliath is going to come down. But you build that before you hear Goliath. It's what Joshua is telling us. 
Don't be terrified. Don't be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So begin to build a good news list. He's been with me here and here and here and here. I have known him in all of those places and I trust him today. It starts with thinking about God's word. Look at Hebrews chapter four. This is New Testament. The word of God is living and active. It's not dead history. It's a living thing inspired by the spirit of God, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. One of the most difficult things to know is your heart. So many competing factors and different influences, and we need God's word to help us understand our own hearts. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1. You've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. There is something about God's word that will reach into your life beyond time. Peter makes the comparison in the next sentence. He says, men are like grass and their glory is like the flowers of the field. It's just here for a moment and gone. Subject to temperature or precipitation or humidity. But the word of God, he said, is living and endures. Spend some time. What are you giving yourself to? I don't have 40 minutes to read. Really? Really? I bet if you turned off the social media or the broadcast material that you watch, you could find a few minutes. Not forever, just for a little window of time. God's word has a value that we we struggle to attach to it. We think of it as intrusive and cumbersome, maybe even loathsome. I want to skip down to the passage in Matthew 13. Jesus is teaching the parable of the sower. Remember that? It's a man who went out to sow seed, a farmer or or somebody that wanted to sow seed in their garden and they sowed it indiscriminately. They didn't, they didn't till a patch of ground. They just, they just cast the seed about. Kind of like you're hiding Easter eggs for toddlers. There's not really any hiding. You're just gonna throw them across the yard and there's gonna be a human vacuum cleaner coming. Well, that's kind of the imagery of this farmer. He's just going to randomly sow the seed, and there's four different locations identified in the story. And now Jesus is going to explain it to us. And what I want to draw your attention to is the antagonism towards the Word of God. The the adversarial nature that exists between you benefiting from it. Listen to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. You imagine that evil would come to take from you, to diminish your awareness, your memory, your attention, your focus, your thoughts on what you have heard about the kingdom of God. There's an adversarial nature in this. People say, well, you know, I open my Bible to read it and I get sleepy. Stand up. You don't get sleepy when you're pursuing your favorite hobbies. There's an adversary. It just doesn't stop there. Look in verse 20. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears it and receives it with joy, but he lasts only a short time because trouble or persecution comes because of the word. There will be challenges to the word of God in your heart. People say, I don't believe that. Or you'll hear other information that stands in opposition to it. Or someone will question it. And you, at this point, you have a decision to make. Am I going to believe? Am I going to be an advocate? Or am I going to yield? Many, many times. I've been in many academic settings. I love to learn. I like universities. I like secular settings where they don't believe about God. It's like I get to listen to their game plan. Doesn't cause me to panic. It's easier to believe God. But you've got to be prepared. There's going to be challenges that come. Verse 22, the one who received the seed that fell amongst the thorns is the man who hears the word of God. But the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it and they make it unfruitful. These are internal. These are self-inflicted wounds. God's word in your heart is not fruitful because of the worries you carry, the anxieties you carry, the things that you give preference to in your thoughts and your emotions above God's word. The deceitfulness of wealth, deception is the, 
is a portion of the truth, but it promises something that can't be delivered. That's what it means to be deceived. And wealth is deceitful. Wealth makes you think you can secure your future.